All right, we're live. Okay, hey, I guess I'm starting. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Super Amigos. Uh, love being in this space with you, as strange as it is. Um, we're going to start with, um, I just have a few thoughts to share, just to activate imagination. And then we're going to get to um, writing a little, a little, what I'm calling three portals, um, but they're basically prompts. And then we'll get into sharing and Q&A. Sound good? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with this um, Rumi quote that I love. Do not be satisfied with the stories that come before you. Unfold your own myth. And uh, first time I read that, it just struck very deeply in my soul. And uh, a lot of the work that I do centers around engaging with the mythic, uh, activating the mythic, seeking the mythic. And uh, I know nowadays people use the word myth as this is a falsehood, and I reject that definition. <laughs> uh, falsehood are falsehoods, but um, the mythic is actually the great truths, right? That's our stories and our myths are about sharing great truths. Uh, I believe there are ancestors uh, giving us guidance, warnings, inspiration, trying to understand our world, our existence, giving us pathways for that. And, um, and also great wisdom and healing. So that's something I'm really constantly searching both as a, as a writer, an actor, a teacher, is getting deep into the mythic, you know. Um, and I believe, you know, where, wherever we come from, we come from great stories. And if we ever needed that now, if we ever needed that guidance, if we ever needed that wisdom, it's in this moment. So um, I'm going to bring into the space uh, two deities that I like to open up to. One is Itzamana, Mayan god of writing and healing. He's often depicted as this old guy who really loves to listen. And he has a gourd. And uh, Menemosini, who is the Greek goddess of the arts and of memory. And I think it's so important that both of these gods, they, they're connected to the arts, but they're also connected to healing, right? So when we write, we are activating healing. Um, through Itzamana, when we, uh, when we are creating, we're also remembering, right? It's our job as artists to remember the things that the culture wants to pour concrete over, wants to forget, right? So I, I open us up to both Itzamana and Mene Mosini. Um, and I'm gonna offer these three portals for us to write. Um, let me just copy and put this in the, mm, it's not letting me paste. Oh, there we go. So the first one, I'll read it out because some people may not be able to access the, um, the chat, but I, I put the questions in the chat and just see which one of these um, stirs your soul. Uh, maybe all of them, right? Or maybe Itzamana or, and or Mnemosini open something up for you and you're, you wanna work from there. Uh, but you'll just put pen to page and just let yourself write and I'll time us. Uh, so the first is think of a childhood song or story that captured your imagination has stayed with you. Think of a childhood song or story that captured your imagination has stayed with you. Number two is what people were talked about in your home growing up 
Who did you hear about over and over again and were curious about? What people were talked about in your home growing up? Who did you hear about over and over again and were curious about? And the third is, did you have a secret hiding place as a child? A place of refuge where you found comfort, make believe? Did you have a secret hiding place as a child, a place of refuge where you found comfort, make believe? Okay, anybody have any questions? Okay, then we can just start. Marissa, is this a 15 minute writing yes. time? Yes, this is a 15 minute writing time. Yes, Rose, you can choose one or whatever this, whatever your impulse is. Uh, uh, maybe you wanna do a combination or maybe it's a mano or mnemosini, stirred something up and you follow whatever that impulse is.
Okay, so we can start to uh, finish up and maybe come together. I prefer a gallery view. <laughs> So, um, they, uh, you have, you're able to see hands or if someone wants to, has, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for ease today, you can unmute yourself if I don't get to you quickly enough. Um, but I think if everybody can raise your hand, if you'd like to uh, share or ask a question, um, that'll keep us, keep us organized. So does anybody want to share or ask a question about this or have a thought about this exercise? Um, I have a thought. This is Rose. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes we can okay. hear you. Okay. So Rose from Seattle. Um, I had a thought that um, my mind was always wrestling. I mean, this is something maybe particular to me what do I choose, right? Oh, what do I choose? Where do I start? Once I pick an idea, I have to go down that pathway. What if I change? And so my mind starts struggling for a structure. And so the structure, I was remembering um, a lot of songs from that my mom used to sing to us. And I've used them before in other plays. Um, but I was thinking how present they are. So I started just jotting down. I thought I can't spend the whole time writing down lyrics to songs because that's not the exercise. Um, and then I put lines and then I started writing in what seemed to jog my memory from that song just as a way of a fake structure, even just something to be a container. So between verses of different songs, I just started plopping in um, little bits of memory. So that's. I think my brain needs to some kind of a structure, even just to play around. So that was something I noticed. Oh, great. Yeah, and it's interesting how what you needed, you gave yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, oh, I need this. And then something responded. You know, I, I love that. I love the way in which uh, you know, again, it's like the body leads us to what we need. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I also, um, you know, there is something about, um, you know, it's so hard. I find this happens with me all the time. Like I, I resist the, um, ability to just generate and generate and not worry about structure, right? Just to allow whatever's working inside me to, to be released, right? And, and then later on, I can take a, take a look at that and see what I wanna pull from that or where a section may lead me to. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something, it just has to do with how practical our culture is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that actually take time for something that is impractical. Like, I, I know I feel it all the time. Like, I can't do that. Like, I have to, you know, mm -hmm. I have to come up with something. Um, and we don't. We don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can find circular ways. You know, it doesn't have to just be a direct line. We can find circular ways to our truth, you know, to mm -hmm. whatever is really needing to speak with us or to us right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rose. You're welcome. And I'm happy to share if no one else wants to share, but I don't want to take up too much time. Ooh. Why don't you go for it? It looks like, looks like people are still wrapping up a little bit. Okay, let's see. So I started. Tengo una muñeca de vestido azul con zapatos blancos y velo de tul. La llevé a la plaza, se me costipo. La llevé al médico, me recetó una pastita de aceite castor. 
y la tengo en cama con un gran dolor. My tío Fernando, my dad's older brother, he owned a record renting business with my abuelito Mariano and my dad, renting 78s and 33 LPs and a record player they called a pickup. The business was called Music Hall. They were the first DJs of the Americas. My tío Fernando loved the parties, the music, the dancing. He came to the US but was sent back. He was not well. He was taken away in a white straight jacket as we watched from the window. He went back to Peru. My dad said, from pure boredom one day, he slit his own throat. Una chica de mi barrio, que Rosita se llamaba, muy alegre siempre estaba, caminaba muy formal, con sus libros bajo el brazo. My mom talked about her grandma, Abuelita Magdalena, who lived in Arequipa. She had my mom, Rosa, with an aristocratic gentleman, an, an Italiano named Toranzo. She sent Rosa to live with him for a better education. Mom says my Abuelita Rosa always resented her mom for giving her away. Los ojos moros de mi morena, que una tarde yo la vi caminando por la noche, lo coloco, la seguí. My mom said that when she first met my dad, he used to call her Señorita Bolívar because of her big sideburns. I have big sideburns too, which I always hated, even now when they want, even now when they want to turn gray and wild. They met going to the wine festival in Surco, La Vendimia, when Lima still had vineyards in the city. A la cata cata, que parió la gata, cuatro morronguitos y una garrapata. Abuelita told me that the reason that the seven big scars on her chest were from her husband that used to hit her hard. I'm glad he wasn't my grandpa. Ernestina, Tina, she came to our house when I was five. I knew she came to Seattle to stay. I knew she was Armando's sister, but not the same mother. That was always the case, it seemed, in my big extended family. There was a different mother or father, de parte de mamá or de parte de papá, but there was... Never half. We never said half. The end. Oh my God, Rose. That's so powerful. I, Monica shared something that is so true. This, that tension between the innocence of the songs and the life accounts. Mm. Oh, thank yeah, you, Monica. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very powerful. It's very interesting how often, um, when, because I work with, I realized I didn't introduce myself, but I, uh, um, one of the things I've done is a solo show that has traveled around a lot for many years. And, uh, and when I work with artists on solo performance, and especially that first song, that first question, grandparent, a, either a grandmother, more often than not a grandmother or grandfather, and then they become the pathway for the whole piece. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, grandmother, grandfather, um, you know, it, again, it's like, it's just, it is mythic. Um, thank you, Rose. Thank you. Giselle, I see your hand is up. Do you wanna share next? Yeah, I'm excited and also nervous to share because it means that I'm being transparent with my messiness, um, <laughs> but here we go, okay. Na na ni ni que a cuca vem pegar Mamãe tá na roça, papai foi trabalhar Sleep, little one, or the cuca will come for you. Mommy is at the farm and daddy is at work. What a crazy song to sing to a small child to get them to go to sleep. If you don't sleep, a creature will come for you. Your mom and dad are not home. You are alone. You have no protection. Get your ass to sleep. Mm. Scare your child to sleep because it's the most effective the most efficient. Sleep is sacred. We shouldn't be scared into it. It's a place and time of rest and recuperation. Your body takes this time to process and rebuild and reinvigorate. Don't start this process from a place of fear. In sleep, you can have a personal and private dialogue with yourself. In my own sleep, I see David often, which is a note from myself telling me it is safe to let go of him and the anger I feel towards him. He is a weed in my dreamscape that I can pull out. There are flowers, 
burgeoning anyway. And one of them is named Lucas, another named Writing, another my mother, my father, my best friend. All my family and friends in the Bay Area, in LA, in Brazil, in North Carolina, and in New York. During my sleeping hours, I am shown this person I no longer need to hold in my present. He is of the past. I release the pain and anger. I keep the lessons and the love. In sleep, I get stories. I get content to write with. Here's something I received the other night. Africa, West Africa, during the slave trade of 400 years. Not sure what century, but it's a long time ago. I know it's a while ago, but the characters feel contemporary. They're not vintage. Their struggles are our own struggles today, unfortunately. Her name is Sayada. Her name means goodness, shadow, beauty of nature. It also means car in Arabic, which feels important and deliciously anachronistic. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you so much. Thank you. And up for you, beautiful. Uh, um, both you and Rose uh, Herbert said something really important. I want to acknowledge how natural and beautiful Rose Gano's bilingualism is, yours too, Giselle. The way in which we use languages. Um, I know it came up on Friday with Diana, uh, with her Super Amigo playwriting event. And, you know, um, I was thinking about something that Juno Diaz wrote, which is like people in Lord of the Rings, they talk elven you know, throughout and nobody has a problem with that. <laughs> but somehow when we put Spanish or Portuguese or uh, our indigenous languages, it's very threatening for some reason, right? But put it in, share it, let this open up. That's gorgeous. <laughs> Who else? We have Alex Hernandez, you are unmuted. Hi everyone. Um, so I did the first prompt of a person I've heard about my whole life, um, especially when I was younger. Uh, so uh, that person was my paternal great grandmother, and I actually I I, I couldn't remember her name. Um, I have to ask my dad, but I do know that she was kidnapped during the revolution, the Mexican Revolution. Um, she had a family and she had kids and that still didn't stop the revolutionaries from kidnapping her. So for two years she was missing uh, and her mother didn't know where she was. And somehow her mother was able to locate her uh, and managed to sneak her out of the camp dressed as a man. I've never met her, but I've always been curious about like what her life was like in the revolution, how that, did affect, how that affected her as a person. Did she have other señoras that she felt guilty about leaving? Did she find anything about the revolution that she did like compared to her home life? What was her re-entry life? What was it like to come back into a normal life after two years of being a nomad? Is there anything that she left behind that she missed? Oh, that's so great. You have a piece there, Alex. <laughs> Follow. Follow. You said great-grandmother? Yes. Follow yeah. that great -grandmother. She's got, she has, she has things to share. I, I mean, she really does. She, she showed up and she wants to take you somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. King Mas, who else? Francine Torres. Hey there. Alrighty. <clears throat> When I was about five or so, we were driving around Golden Gate Park in my dad's cherry red Buick Skylark. The interior was black leather. It was hot and it smelled like cow, but he loved that thing. My dad worked in a factory and was a classic Chicano macho provider, but he also had a sensitive side too. He took me and my sisters up to Hippie Hill in Golden Gate Park to watch protests or Hare Krishnas or listen to music. I think that he was thrust into responsibility too soon and enjoyed indulging his secret screw the man attitude on his days off. On the radio, War's Spill the Wine song came on, a long monologue that was sort of spoken word with a seductive, heady riff on top. I listened hard to the lyrics. Usually I didn't, so compelling was the voice over his tinny 1970s radio. In it, this dude talks about falling asleep in the grass on a summer's day. A jazzy flute overlays as he describes being in a Hollywood movie and brought naked to a mountaintop. 
An assortment of naked women are presented before him, short ones, tall ones, thin ones, brown ones, you get the picture. A woman somewhere in the middle whispers in his ear and pours him wine, telling him to spill the wine, dig that girl, then again to spill the aforementioned wine and then take that pearl. In my child's brain, I didn't realize that the pearl refers to cunnilingus, but I knew that something about that song stirred in my body places that I never thought about. I thought about the lazy summer day, the grass, how this sort of mythological hippie woman whispering in my ear would have felt like. How pleasant her warm breath and lips would feel on my ear. I thought about the naked man, the assortment of women. I knew vaguely that these were things that I didn't know about, but my body inherently did. I thought about my dad's Santana Abraxas album that he kept meticulously displayed in the front of his album file and how this song made me feel like the large, beautiful black woman reclining in that image. There was another naked angel woman who pointed up towards heaven, I thought. Heaven must be a place where wine and nakedness flowed. This was my baptism to sexuality. Wow. <laughs> Man, what you have such a specific voice and tone. You really took us there. I <laughs> love all those details. I want more. <laughs> all of these. Que rico. Um, there's something that Rose wrote that I just want to open up and hear anybody's thoughts about it. Um, let me see if I can find it. About history. Like we're so attracted to history. Anybody as, as, as writers, as, as artists, anybody want to reflect on that or share anything on that? I just, yeah, what I, I wrote the comment, it, yeah, we're so attracted to history and historical events as writers, and I was responding to the great grandma or grandma being abducted in the Mexican Revolution, but even, you know, the 60s and 70s during Santana's Age of Gold, even that's history now, so yeah, I just wanted to, there's something about the nostalgia of history that I think really, as Latinos, Latinx really moves us. Yeah. And, and also the stories that we don't hear, you know, I'm working on something now that came out of you know, here, seeing a lot of these uh, shows, um, TV shows and stuff that took place in the sixties and there are no people of color in professional jobs. And that's, I, I grew up then. <laughs> I, you know, people, there were people, I, I had friends, you know, my family, you know, they, they're, they're, there's a whole way in which our stories or these time periods are told without us. Um, and how important it is for us to share our history, what we remember, what we know, right? Um, thank you so much, Francine. Anyone else? Yeah, I um, I I. My name is Sophia. Hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to sort of piggyback off of what you said about how our stories, like our history, is told without us, because I also think that's something that's really powerful about looking at history and telling um, sometimes fictional or non-fictional stories. Is that often history, the way that it's taught, um, becomes sort of like this bigger thing that is not tied to any individuals. And so the people within the history and the lessons within the history, I feel like gets lost in the generalness and the, the desire for objectivity because nothing is objective. And whatever history we hear in school is just the winner's perspective, you know? Um, and so I think that being able to tell our stories and trying to see history from a individual perspective, from the stories of the people who were actually there um, as they've been passed down to us, uh, there's so so much power in that that just the objectivity of history cannot, I think, provide the same way. So it's very powerful. Absolutely. Thank you, Sophia. Alexis. Hi. Um, I worked off of the prompt what people were talked about in your home growing up. Did you hear about Gloria? Gloria, yes, Gloria, Gloria. Her mother smokes on the porch every night, her father nowhere to be found. Yes, that Gloria. 
What about Gloria? She's pregnant. Pregnant? No. Yes. From who? That boy she was always walking around the drugstore with. Her mother should have known better than to let her out with that boy. He's no good, you can tell that on sight. She lives with her grandma, mother had no idea. Aye, well, goes to show. She would always wear those shirts that were too low, shorts that were too short, earrings that were too big, makeup that was too old, eyeliner too dark for a 16-year-old. Did I tell you about my niece, your niece? Yes, my niece. No, is she okay? What about your niece? She just had her baby, her baby. Yes, her baby, a healthy baby boy. Of course, we were worried with her being so young, but she's working, wants to go back to school and the baby's dad works two jobs to support them. They're living with me until they can afford a place of their own. Oh, how lovely. Yes, it's lovely. I know she's my niece, but this is different. I really think they're going to be a real family, a real family. He's going to marry her. She picked a good one. My niece won't be an unwed mother. No, no, no. He loves her. He really does. They live with me, so I know. That's great to hear. She sounds happy. She is happy. And that's all that matters. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> I love those characters already. Um, there's a few thoughts up here. I know not everybody can read the, um, the chat, especially if they're on the phone, um, but about history in particular, to the, these are all really important, Sophia and um, Diana, if you wanna share. I just want to I just want to say from my perspective I've had to consciously reteach myself because the fir it, the first thing you think is always what you were inculcated in in school and then you have to really make an effort to make the second thing you think the thing that the thing that is the what you want to change about yourself you know it's a uh, it's really has to be a conscious effort because we are taught a singular vision and a singular um, history that has really almost nothing to do with the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, I love uh, Walter Benjamin, who was an incredible, he has a great essay called the, um, Thesis on the Philosophy of History. And he talks about history being written by the victors, you know. Um, I know I, I did a piece um, there I, in 2008 when, um, oh, I'm totally blanking on this bill. Who's that, TV, the TV? He used to be on Fox News. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I was like blocked him out of his, my mind, but he was, after the election, he was like saying, well, it's the end of traditional America, right? And I remember like having this moment going, what's traditional America, <laughs> you know? And I'm in, yes, Bill O'Reilly. Thank you so much, Chandra uh, and Esther uh, and Rose. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles and we have this incredible history that we don't know about, you know, in terms of who were the founding families of the city of Los Angeles, you know, of the 44 men, women, and children who founded the city, two were white Spaniards and everyone else were people of color. And that's not a, a story that we hear, right? And, not, and I wanted to share it. We did, we did a play about that called the LA Founding Families. So that, that thing of um, what are these histories that are inside of us that need to be told, that we need to hear, right? Is a something I'm, encourage us all, you know, what's missing. And, and, you know, from our particular perspective, that's right, not just the general, uh, but really particular perspective. Even the perspective of great grandmother, you know. Anyone else want to share? Um, so I wrote about my 
I did the prompt, the people that you always were talked about. I mean, I was kind of along the same lines of what we're kind of talking about, about this history, these stories that we've passed. The elders, the ones who came before us, the stories are passed from generation to generation. Never a picture is shown. Rarely do we see a face. We hear a story, a song, a laugh, a cry when their name is said. We cook a food and the smell wafts and reminds us of what has been passed. A lifeblood of people passed from mouth to mouth. Food, stories, that is our people. That is how we live on. I never knew what anyone ever looked like. I never knew the color of their eyes, what clothes they used to wear, what shoes they found to be comfortable, the color of their skin. I knew their name and I knew their stories. It's funny how saying a name can change things. Telling a story brings new life to a person who may be long gone. There's a belief in life after death and we do our part by saying their name. Those we've lost, those we've hated, those we loved, those who always made the best basole, those who no matter what showed up with Crown Royal, those who matter to us. We say their name to remember. We tell their stories so they're never forgotten. The smell of food, the virjanita in the corner, the blanket that became hers because Tia was always cold, or the shows that came on right around 2 p.m. because Abuela never missed her shows, the Crown Royal bag that sits on the fridge filled with quarters or beans for Loteria because no family gathering was complete with at least one game. I wondered what their hair smelled, looked like, what cigarettes they smoked, what the touch of their skin was like, how they made their cafe in the morning. I always wondered if they would have liked me, what songs we'd sing together, what dancing would have happened, what recipes I could have learned, what the smell of their perfume was like, what I could have known about their lives. The countless tias and primas and primos from other places I might have known and their lives passed down in stories, never in pictures. We say their names to remember and we tell their stories to know who we are. Oh my God. That's so moving. There's so much longing in there. So much longing that I, I really relate to, really speaks to me. And this thing about saying a name, right? Placing, th this happened, they exist, right? Sharing their stories. Um, I'm, there's um, something very interesting, you know, the, in order to be original, we have to be connected to the origins. <laughs> Right, there's a reason origin is in that word original. Like I, I, we have to like connect to our roots in order to even understand how we're here, you know. Um, thank you, Solana. Who else, anyone else? That was Mnemosini at work, it sounds like, right? <laughs> For you. Solana, maybe, yeah. That, I mean, and there is something so terrifying about the idea that things won't be remembered, particularly moments in history that tried to be, uh, you know, like I said earlier, concrete poured over it, right? Thank you. Mas. Who else? Well, we have a little bit of time left, and if everyone is done sharing, any anybody have any questions? Um, it can be even to each other. <laughs> Rose is asking, "What's under the concrete?" I think something like that. That history. Um, I think very few people know, let's say, for example, the history of the LA founding families and who actually founded the city and what this part of traditional America is, right? And of course the indigenous uh, culture that was here long before then, right? That's what the, con that's what's over the, underneath the concrete to me. Any other questions? 
thoughts? Marissa, Herbert here. Just as a just as a practical um, to educator to educator, uh, I just yeah. wanted to get your take on why you asked those questions. Was it just more of a portal for us to write, or I just wanted to get your your take on 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 the on the three questions and yeah. why? I guess um, I to me like there's so much gold in. Um, in getting away from the practical. So that means playful and childhood to me, you know? Um, I, it's worked for me personally and I've seen how, I've seen when I've worked with students who are, um, and in particular who are working on solo performance pieces, how they can get very stuck with, well, I'm supposed to do this or, you know, it's supposed to, and then I feel like that's a trap. So if we can kind of just let ourselves activate our imaginations, really also allow for something to come in that may be not part of the plan. And that kind of assembly line thing, like, okay, first you do this, then you do that. And then, and, and all those structures are important. <laughs> um, I'm, but I think especially initially, you wanna just say, what's, what's here? What's gonna show up that maybe I haven't paid attention to, right? Um, so that's, uh, and in terms of solo performance, there's, um, there are often these, I mean, I, uh, uh, several people, what a great opening the song was for, for several people, right? Um, the thing about who was talked about that you're curious, often a lot of the students I work with or artists I work with will have um, somebody in their, background and their family history that they never really asked about. And then that becomes the portal for their entire piece, you know? Um, and the third one is more about um, when, in a way, it's about connecting to that calling, that initial creative calling. Um, what are some of the things that showed up that made your soul, soul awaken that made you want to perform. So that's, that's where those three came from. Um, just adding to that, um, Marissa and Herbert, I was thinking that prompt of what stories did you hear most growing up? That in itself is a retelling. So I think storytelling is re-storytelling. And that's where the history part comes in because that's the way it's handed down. So what stories or who was most talked about growing up? You know, we hear these stories that could be from this country or another country, but we're, we're already retelling it. So you're like, you can invoke the character of that storyteller because that story was filtered through their point of view and they're telling a story about someone else. There's something like a never ending mirror back and forth, back and forth that I think is the um, attractive thing about that prompt. It involves retelling and retelling. Perfect. And also that maybe for some of us, um, accessing childhood isn't a, a necessarily happy thing. And so it maybe brings up some interesting feelings that, that you can just start writing about, you know? I think that that's what I really, I love these prompts because I, I, I thought some really interesting things came out of them for me because I, I sort of dug into some things that, I, that I'm reluctant to dig into. So, um, and I think it's okay to be messy with that, you know? And it's okay to let that be and not share it, but live with it a little bit and see what stories that generates for later. You know, I really like that. I'm so glad you said that because I almost left the third one out <laughs> because it makes me nervous, <laughs> right? And in a way that is, that's such a big part of our work is our work as human beings, especially right now, being uncomfortable, right? Um, but I also wanted to put there a place of ref refuge and make believe like we always have, no matter how deep the pain, or what that evokes, that there are places of refuge for us, you know, um, that there are 
our our nets, our stories to help sustain us. I honestly believe that's what we do and, and why we're needed. I'm trying to read. Um, Lisa's hand is up. I want to allow this conversation to continue, but I also want to recognize that she's waiting to jump in. Uh, Issa, if you'd like to unmute yourself and jump in at any time, you're more than welcome. I just have a question. Um, I'm an actor that's only starting to write in quarantine. I've like I've written poetry for a while, but uh, playwriting is new to me. So I'm just curious to how being an actor has impacted your playwriting and vice versa. Uh, I'm definitely an actor first, and I um, avoided writing for a long time because it made me nervous. <laughs> And then I, I really had a story. I mean, I really had, in particular, a great grandmother that wouldn't let me sleep <laughs> until I started writing my first piece. Um, and, uh, you know, actors naturally understand story and structure and dialogue. I mean, you, you have everything you need to make this piece. You have everything you need. There's nothing, there's no like, magic system or, you know, um, somebody I know, uh, Kalyan, um, who's an incredible um, actor and she created a solo performance. And, you know, when, I, when she was asked recently, how, how, do you, how did you do that? How did it start? She goes, well, I lit a candle and I asked my ancestors for help. And then there's the beginning. I mean, it can be very simple, but it's amazing how as soon as you open the door, and you've probably already felt that, Isa, like that things just start appearing. Like you're you're gonna you're gonna have like aids <laughs> help you tell this story, and you have everything you need to tell it. Thank you. Yeah, Diana says, "How many Latinx writers are actors first? <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, how many of us? <laughs> A bunch." <laughs> Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, okay, hi. Hey. Um, yeah, just following up on Issa's question, I'm so grateful she asked that because I was thinking that, but then I was like, oh my god, I'm the only actor here. Obviously, that's not true. <laughs> um what like I don't know, like I have this story that's been tumbling in my head and in my body to the point where like I got a tattoo of something and I'm like, I know. I know this is like a solo show, like I know it is. And I guess like, what is your advice for someone who like poetry comes out of me when like my body is literally begging me to write <laughs> and I'm such a physical actor. So I'm wondering like, what's your advice for like, I don't know, someone who feels like they literally struggle with like words or like that's not like their first thing but you're saying that you have poetry that you do that poetry comes out of your your movement right yes it's very random though trust the random keep keep writing and keep moving don't stop moving and there are many solo performers i think i might have put my email at the very top of the chat um i can put it again but I can also direct you to, there are many solo performers who focus on the physical and they are incredible uh, creators of solo performance, right? It, your, your solo performance doesn't, show doesn't have to follow any, anybody else's model. Maybe yeah. very physical with poetry, right? And the important thing is to just keep, um, Keep yourself open to where your body, your body is clearly leading you, wants to take you. Keep generating the work, writing the poems. Listen to your body. You can trust your body. Thank you. You're very welcome. Alex, I see you have your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. So you're ready to go. Hi again. Um, I wanted to kind of revisit writing about um, relatives or like ancestors. And uh, one of the things 
So I, I also write poetry, but one of the things that I'm always hes hesitant about writing, especially like with living family, is um, writing about family. <laughs> You know, yeah. I think it's really hard, and especially I think specifically with this, with this, my, you know, this relative, like we have the facts, and here's the timeline. Um, and I guess I worry about embellishing. Like my questions are about like feeling and like, what were you feeling? Like what did you miss? Did you enjoy it? I mean, I'm sure there are aspects of it that are traumatic. So like, what is a way to I guess respectfully do that? Yeah. Thank you so much for that question that is very important and I know exactly I, I, I had very similar feelings when I started working on my solo show like uh, especially when it came to interviewing my father about a vi some very very painful stuff um, and what you will find is that more often than not people want to share their story and it, particularly if it's painful and that it is very healing for them um, so the, you may be at first a little nervous about approaching, but if you approach with an open heart, right. And really say, I really want to, I want to write about this. And, um, I think you may be surprised how willing people are to share their stories. It's happened to me over and over again as a writer, whether it's a, my solo play or other, uh, plays that I've written where I've had to interview people and their stories were in the play, um, that they want to share their stories in, in this form, maybe more than sharing it with a therapist or anything like that. There's something about what we have to offer, right, in terms of a kind of alchemy that is that people respond to. And, you know, um, a lot of people, have, you know, you can also email me because there are a lot of people that have written different um, ways of addressing those interviews. Um, and I have a solo performance chapter in a book I've, I've just written called Mythic Imagination and the Actor. And I have a couple of like guide, guidelines and I can just send that to you if you like. But um, I just wanna assure you, I understand that, that it's scary, but there's actually, you may be welcomed right? It may be welcomed and, and more important, needed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add on that, Alex, that's such a great question. And I'm always worried about writing about family because I love them and they're so beautiful. And I, I want to share those stories because I think that they're what make me who I am. And also as an artist, I asked one of my teachers and they've always taught me that there's the truth and there's what you can embellish in favor of good drama and a good story. And one of the things that I think make characters so interesting are their flaws and what makes us root for them the most are their flaws, but I don't wanna write my family's flaws. <laughs> so it's like having stories that are, and characters that are inspired by real people and that's what makes them honest and rooted. And then also finding places to embellish for the purpose of a story, a theme, a message that I'm trying to to get across. So I think that that ultimately depends on on how you feel as an artist and your intention with story. Because I know my grandma, my grandma's very very private. There are things that she doesn't like shared. And then there's my mom who wants me to write a character like her in all of my works. So <laughs> it just depends on how how you develop and think is important and necessary to your story as a writer. That's fantastic. There's also for things that are very difficult, there's um, metaphor, you know, you can, you can find ways of telling the painful story and moving away from the factual into a metaphorical kind of tale. I mean, one of my favorite films is Get Out and it's totally a metaphor, right? <laughs> So um, I put my email if anybody has any um, questions they want to send me because we're we're at time and I I so um, appreciate your wisdom and your beautiful words and your energy and feel very fortunate to be part of this comunidad. Thank you all. And anybody wants to be in touch with me uh, again, 
mtbas at calarts.edu, I forgot to put. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. Great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Really wonderful. Bye, everyone. We'll see you on Friday, same time, same place. Uh, and I'll be sure to Is save the chat. Who is it Friday? In case anybody needs it. Oh, who is it? Mm. I should know this off the top of my head, but I will get it. All of the uh, live streams are saved and recorded and announced on HowlRound. And on Friday, we will have... Ooh, it's on the second page of our upcoming stuff. Uh, Brian Quijada. That'll be a fun one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and save the chat and we will see you all next week.